Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, this is Corey DiBiase with the National Veterans Technical Assistance Center. Uh, as always, I am joined by Nicole, Cindy, and Carrie, your friendly uh, NVTAC team. Very happy to be here with you today. Also very happy to have some, uh, uh, some guests on the line who are going to talk with us about some of the ideas that we were just starting to touch on on Monday and that we've been making reference to through the course of this series um, uh, again, the ideas around uh, guided group discovery, discovery, customized employment that I think folks are going to be really interested in. Um, as we've been talking about, we we feel this is really uh, uh, this this fits very well into a toolbox that includes ideas like the stages of change, like motivational interviewing, like trauma informed care, like peer to peer strategies that we've been discussing all along. Uh, this is really just a Another great set of strategies that fit very well into that uh, into that toolbox, and we're really excited to be joined by some guests who we'll be introducing in just a moment. Uh, but just to get into some standard housekeeping stuff, uh, first of all, uh, you, this is, as you can see, a uh, different look and feel for the slides here because uh, – and we'll explain uh, who our guests are and where they're from and what they're going to be presenting today, of course. But um, that also means you're going to miss our typical slide with the picture of how you interact with, with the GoToWebinar uh, interface. I'm sure folks have it pretty well down by now. But, um, of course, we want to hear from you throughout this, as always. Uh, you can type questions and comments into the question box. Uh, there will be a couple instances uh, in the middle of the presentation and then at the end of the presentation where uh, we'll want to hear your thoughts, your response to that homework assignment that we talked about last time, and of course, just your general questions. You're always welcome to raise your hand as well as using that question box. We, uh, As much as we obviously are in love with the sound of our own voices, we, we love yours even more. So really, really happy to hear folks um, coming on the line and, and talking right to us. A couple other things uh, we have today. Um, if you wish to, you'll see we have captioning as part of the presentation today. If anyone would like to personalize that, uh, you can take the link that is on the screen right there, and we're going to actually put that into the chat box. Um, you can take that link, click on that link, and that will give you a window for this that you can control yourself. You can then adjust the background color. You can adjust the placing. You can adjust everything else so that that can be entirely personalized to you. Um, uh, so anyone who wishes to avail themselves of that, you're more than welcome to. You are also, if you have any questions about that, of course, uh, drop them right into that question box, and we will be sure to address those as well. Um, but otherwise, without further ado, to uh, in, to say hello to, to this group and to introduce our presenters, I would like to introduce Rose Warner with the Office of Disability Employment Policy. Uh, Rose is a longtime colleague and friend uh, and has been working in these issues around uh, um, employment for folks with significant barriers to careers for quite some time uh, and uh, has just done some great work. And it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the line with us. Uh, Rose, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Corey. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us on the webinar today. Uh, as Corey said, uh, my name is Rose Warner, and I am a policy advisor at the Office of Disability Employment Policy. Uh, in addition to doing the work on increasing competitive integrated employment for people with disabilities, I also am really focusing in on trying to increase competitive integrated employment for veterans with disabilities. So I've been working very closely with um, our VETS colleagues. In fact, uh, the VETS offices are geographically located right next door to ODEP's office within our big DOL building in DC. So I not only see them in the hallways, but work with them uh, in many ways as well. So I wanted to go ahead and introduce you to our presenters today. Um, they are Rebecca Ceylon and Nancy Burdeau and they both come from the LEAD Center. The LEAD Center is a policy development center funded by ODEP. So Rebecca has been leading the LEAD Center for seven years now, uh, since its inception. She also serves as the point of contact for another program run by ODEP for DC called VOICE. Um, and she is just a wealth of knowledge on everything when it comes to disability and disability employment policy. 
Um, Nancy Boudot has led countless numbers of training on guided group discovery. Um, and she and Rebecca have helped to create a guided group discovery guide specifically focused on veterans. So you guys are in really good hands with these presenters today. And in fact, um, you will see them again next week. So this is sort of a two part series, if not more, um, but Rebecca and Nancy are, are leading the two webinars. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to them and uh, take it away, ladies. Thank you so much, Rose. Uh, this is Rebecca Salon. I'm very happy to be with you today. Um, this is a topic that I'm pretty passionate about. Um, so the LEAD Center promotes customized employment as a universal design, as an approach that benefits both employees and employers. And we know that you discussed universal design some in your last session, so some of this may be familiar to you. And you'll hear more about customized employment in our next session, but we wanna introduce it here since discovery and guided group discovery lay the foundation for customized employment. So today we'll talk about discovery, discuss the rationales for using guided group discovery, and explore guided group discovery strategies that can benefit veterans during their job search. You also will learn to identify ways to guide veterans in determining how their military training, discipline, and mission focus can benefit an employer. And we will provide you with links to resources to support veterans transitioning into civilian employment. Both customized employment and guided group discovery build upon many of the topics you've already explored. We know that you've had previous sessions on trauma-informed approaches, peer supports and mentoring, motivational interviewing, and more. Those strategies underpin many of the approaches that are used in guided group discovery. And as you heard um, in the last session on this topic, customized employment is not a new concept. It has been formally promoted by the Department of Labor for almost 20 years now, and is now discussed as a best practice in all hiring. Um, and as, as is noted here, um, the Federal Register formally defined it in 2002 as individualizing the employment relationship between employees and employers in ways that meet the needs of both. And then almost 10 years later, it was defined by the Office of Disability Employment Policy as a flexible process based on an individualized match between the strengths, conditions, and interests of a job candidate and the identified business needs of an employer. And we'll talk more about what the conditions of employment for a job seeker might be but briefly, it refers to those things that people need to be in place to be successful. It's not just the things that would be nice or preferences that we may have, but those things that we really require to be successful. We all have conditions that we need to be in place for us to be successful. And sometimes we don't know about them until they're tested. For months, I worked in a setting that people refer to as a cubicle farm and the amount of visual and auditory noise was, was overwhelming. I learned that one of my conditions for employment is that I need some time where I can focus without, without that background noise and that I'm highly distractible. So we all have conditions that relate to us. Teleworking right now for many people may have highlighted conditions that people didn't know they had, making them more or less productive. And you'll hear more about this important concept shortly. Customized employment strategies are helpful in many aspects of life, whether a person has a disability or not. Many people use career assessments and other methods, methods to identify their career interests and talents. Most of us use personal and professional connections to find jobs. When needed, we request flexible work schedules or modifications to accommodate further education, family situations, or other commitments. Identifying what might be a good job match may be more difficult for people with barriers to employment, like homelessness, communication limitations, physical disabilities, PTSD, severe and persistent mental health issues, 
cognitive processing issues, substance use disorders, and so on. For example, people who have difficulty communicating may not be as able to respond quickly to assessment questions, such as those in typical interviews. People dealing with past trauma, homelessness, or other issues may have a difficult time expressing their interests or explaining their talents. Work environments are often not designed to be sensitive to people with sensory issues, such as temperature intolerances, noise levels, and lighting. Customized employment strategies open doors for people who have not been successful in achieving competitive employment due to the complexity of their disability or other barriers to employment. It promotes the identification of interests, talents, and conditions for employment in a way that brings that out of people, and the group process does it even better. It supports people with barriers to employment to attain their employment goals when traditional strategies have not been successful. It assists in the implementation of ongoing supports that promotes employment retention. And, and we know that veterans' engagement in the process is a key advantage to these strategies. So guided group discovery and customized employment have the potential to keep veterans engaged where other strategies might unintentionally push them away or have them play a less active role. So what is included in a customized approach to employment? There are a number of customized employment approaches, approaches but they all have common elements. The discovery process on which we'll focus today gathers information that describes who is this person. It enables you to learn about the person in new ways and enables them to see things in themselves that they did not see as assets or skills that can benefit an employer. Discovery identifies what interests people, what are the skills and contributions that they bring, who do they know who can assist them in their job search process, when are they at their best, what are they doing when they're at their best? Who are they with? Those, those types of things. So it really does discover information and collects it. We then translate that information into a written document or a profile or blueprint for employment. It's called different things and different approaches. But regardless, it provides a written summary of what was learned in the discovery process. And this translates their past activities, interests, themes, skills, and ideal conditions of employment into potential career possibilities. There typically is a customized employment planning meeting and the development of a plan to secure employment. At those meetings, people generate specific ideas of businesses to approach, next steps, who will make those approaches and things like that. And the next step then is to schedule informational interviews to gather information about the employers and community needs. And we don't know what we don't know. The best way to learn what the needs of an employer are is to get out and talk to people. This is where people might tap into their networks. And, and again, they would identify their networks during the discovery process and where they might build their own network. If one of the vocational themes that was identified by someone involved in discovery was mentoring youth, then talking to people who run youth programs could help them in identifying unmet needs, positions in where there's high turnover, other employers that might be hiring, and so on. So we use informational interviews to, to discover both employer and community needs. And finally, when a match exists, we propose employment. If we find an employer with an unmet need that matches what an individual is seeking, based on their discovery process and their customized employment plan, we can approach an employer to consider hiring this person to meet that business need. And again, this all engages veterans in, in the process so that they're playing a very active role. So what is discovery? Discovery is always the first step in customized employment. Discovery seeks to find out who the person is right now, what are their interests and preferences, what are their skills, and what are their past and potential contributions to an employer, and again, under what conditions will they be successful. So the discovery process is used to match someone seeking employment 
to an employer's needs so that it's a win-win situation where both the employer and potential employee benefit. And I think you all were asked in the last session to think about the question that appears on this slide. What are the ways in which your job has been customized over time? So please take a few minutes to type into the, the chat box the ways in which your job has been customized over time. If you've been in a position for any length of time, it's likely that your job has been customized. So what are things that people look to you for? And I know you've also discussed a workforce of one in your last session, you know, that that you know gives other ideas for how employers are customizing job. So what are things that people look to you for, whether or not it's in your official job description? And I think um, people can either raise their hands and Corey will unmute you, or you can type into the uh, into the box. Yep, that's absolutely right. So you've got, uh, folks can type into the question box, folks can raise their hands. Uh, and this, uh, as, as Rebecca said, this was our, our homework from last time uh, to just think about all these different possible ways that uh, that different adjustments and, and different changes that can happen across the course of a career. Corey, there's a comment um, in the question box, a few coming in um, that says, uh, stay at home mom's goal of family turned into non-traditional outreach to our HVRP participants, increasing connection and retention. So I'm sorry, her schedule changed to correlate her goals and meet the needs of the program. So the um, accommodation and change of um, outreach and uh, if I'm Dawn, if I'm capturing this correctly, um, the modification of the schedule changing and, and customization to make it work for this particular veteran. Great, thank you. That's great, thanks. Are there ways in which your job may have been customized over time? Just a reminder, we do love to see those hands raised. Oh, it looks like we have uh, Angelo would like to to uh, raise his hand and let us know what he is thinking. So I'm going to unmute Angelo right now. And uh, Angelo, before you begin, you'll notice uh, cough free, a uh, voice like an angel over here. So thank you very much. <laughs> and you should be on the line, Angelo. Can you can we hear you? Oh, okay. It looks like. That was a misconnection. So, uh, we do see uh, Sherman has made has uh, made a comment. We've incorporated a completely digital format for our filing. We work Best Notes software, and that allows us to do this. It works out well because any one of the multiple programs that a veteran is cross enrolled in, it allows them to access the information we've already uh, collected. That's great, thank you. Well, we encourage you to continue to think about ways in which your job has been customized. I know for me, regardless of the position I've been in, it seems like my jobs always involve training, always involve grant writing. People call on me to do editing. I'm invited to meetings where people are having trouble finding common ground. None of those things necessarily are in my job description, but those are things that people have recognized in me over time. And, and so it becomes part of how my role gets, gets customized. And I suspect that there are things that people pull you into, that, that you are the go-to person, um, whether or not it's part of your official job, if you've been in your position for any amount of time, chances are your, your position. Um, has been customized. So there's a few more things we'd like to highlight about discovery before we focus on the actual process of discovery and guided group discovery. There are some beliefs and values on which discovery is based. Each stage of the process 
supports the premise that there are unlimited ways to make a living in the world and that there's a place for everyone to make a contribution and earn a living. So it really is a, a zero reject way of looking at, um, at employment, that there aren't just some jobs for some people, but there really are unlimited ways that people can make a living and make a contribution. That all people are viewed as employable and can make a contribution to the economic well-being of the business, that guidance from a discovery facilitator does not mean control. We talk about the role of the facilitator later, but, but this is a reminder that the veteran is always in control. It's their employment plan, it's their future. They have the final say at each stage of the job search process. And that leads us to the next point, which is that the individual themselves, in this case, the veteran, must be the key decision maker and agrees to take action that, that has been agreed upon for their, for their plan. So you meet the veteran where they are and you support them to drive their own job search. And we also want to highlight that discovery can be used in any program. It's useful for an initial assessment of skills and contributions and conditions of employment that, that someone may have. It identifies the supports needed and partners you may want to have at the table to bring in from the many programs with which you interact. And it can be added to intake. So some of the things that you'll see that we do as part of discovery can become part of the intake process so that you're learning some of those things up front. Or guided group discovery can be part of a job club or something that, that your program or your partner programs do. And regardless of the program, discovery creates a blueprint for employment that guides planning and job development. So it gives you a way forward. It promotes the braiding and leveraging of resources across systems. It helps to identify other systems and programs that can provide support. And it leads to successful outcomes for everyone who participates in it. And this can support the stages of change that you've been discussing. You know, most specifically, it involves contemplation, it involves preparation and, and action. Customized employment is an evidence-based practice. Our guided group discovery approach, approach is adapted from the work of Mark Golden Associates, Griffin Hamas Associates, and Transcend. And all three of those organizations played a role in developing and field testing the Gaia Group Discovery materials. We know that you've talked previously about the benefits of peer supports and peer mentoring. The Gaia Group Discovery process uses peer support to promote self-reflection. It offers participants the opportunity to learn and receive feedback from others, and is potentially for everyone, for anyone, but not necessarily for everyone. Um, so the group might not be for some individuals. People who experience social anxiety might be um, a, a poor fit for a guided group discovery approach. People who might not be able to self-identify their interests and capabilities for some reason. People who might not be able to complete the exercises and assignments even with support. And there are other types of discovery, which we'll discuss that might be a better match for some people. So, so you'll hear a little bit about other approaches to discovery that don't involve a group process. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Nancy Buteau, to provide you with the specifics about guided group discovery. Nancy? Thanks so much, Rebecca. Uh, appreciate that great information. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the rationale for guided group discovery. And you know, um, I, I think that like this changing landscape that we have right now is the perfect time to talk about this. And I think y'all just talked about this earlier in your last session too, where you talked about kind of old versus new employer paradigms. So um, things are changing at a rapid rate uh, right now in our society. And I think it's the perfect time for customized employment and discovery to, to fit right in. 
So what customized employment does is it seeks to um, kind of take away from the traditional job search strategies that we're used to using um, that kind of compare people to a standard job description. We're going to talk about job description a lot um, in, in this presentation. Um, but we try to take away from where we're comparing people to job descriptions or to other job candidates, which is what traditional, traditional job development strategies do. Um, Typically, they utilize vocational uh, evaluations, prepare people by getting resumes together. We practice interviewing skills, uh, as well as maybe possibly other some soft skills. Then the job seeker and the employment uh, person identify available jobs through wherever that may be online, Craigslist, you know, employment departments, sometimes cold calling, and assist people with filling out applications and then going to, to interviews. So, so kind of the traditional approach that, that we've all done. You know, I, I started my role finding for jobs for people with disabilities in 1991. And this is, I followed this script to a T. Um, what we talk about in customized employment is looking at candidates whose skills best meet certain parts of a job description. So unfortunately, some veterans with disabilities or maybe other barriers to employment may not stand out as the most qualified candidate. And that's because the employer is looking at the entire job description. Um, I don't know about you all, but I, I can't remember the last time I saw a job description. I don't think I've ever seen my job description <laughs> from National Disability Institute, and I'm not complaining at all. Um, you know, I, I do what they tell me to do. But, um, you know, getting away from that traditional job description, you know, and uh, other duties as assigned, um, and sticking more to like, what are the tasks? What are the tasks necessary in order to? to get this job done that meets the skills of the individual and the needs of the employer. So the customized approach circumvents that comparative process by focusing on the person's skills and how those skills meet um, some of the needs that the employer has. And the assumption that we always use in discovery is that employers are always hiring. Um, even, and we'll talk about it more next week even in the economy right now there's a lot more gig um jobs that are that are popping up um with with everything that's that's going on um so the assumption is that employers are always hiring as long as the potential employee brings value to the business because what it comes back down to for the employer is basically money right they need money to keep their establishment in business and to pay their employees. It also relies on the use of informational interviews, which we're gonna talk about, to collect information on what an employer's needs are. So sometimes an employer may have a, a missing piece of the puzzle that we as professionals can help them identify. Um, and then, ooh, isn't it even better if not only we help them identify it, but we actually have a candidate or two who might be able to fill that role and make the employer happy um, in the process. So customized employment kind of completely removes the job seeker from that comparative process of comparing that person to a hundred other people that might be applying for a job. And the employer only has to decide if this one job candidate can meet that identified business need or needs. So there are several formats, as Rebecca mentioned, for discovery. Uh, facilitated discovery is more of a one-on-one -on -one process. Uh, guided group discovery is what we're going to be uh, talking about um, mostly today. And then there's also self-guided discovery where somebody goes through the process on their own. And maybe they report back to um, a, a career consultant on a weekly or a monthly basis as they go through their own um, self-guided process. 
So at the end of this presentation, we are going to give you lots of resources on guided group discovery and self-guided discovery, including workbooks, um, online workbooks, facilitator guides, and PowerPoints. So in terms of guided group, you'll have all the information that you need, as well as self-guided. Um, we don't really talk too much about facilitated discovery, uh, which again goes back to that one-on-one -on -one, um, process that isn't necessarily for um, the, the individuals that you're serving. Uh, so the profile for guided group discovery, Rebecca kind of went through this uh, a little bit, enjoys working with others, kind of says that in the name, right? Guided group, um, somebody who doesn't like working in a group, then self-guided would probably be uh, a better option. It's also for somebody who has one or more barriers to employment um, and are really struggling um, getting back into the workforce. It's also good for people who have specific conditions of employment that need to be addressed. And we're gonna go into um, learning what our conditions of employment are uh, a little later on in the, the presentation. Um, and you guys also kind of talked about it a little bit earlier in the chat, and please feel free to keep that up. Um, and then lastly, those traditional approaches that we talked about, a person would fit here if they just haven't been successful in the past with those traditional approaches. So we have five guided group discovery lessons. You can call them lessons, you can call them sessions, you can call them classroom meetings, whatever you want. For, for what we're using here today, we're just saying lesson, um, but it's it's not like it's you know it's 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 easy discovery is easy in fact some of these lessons can actually um, be put before one another you might want to talk to someone about their interests and contributions before talking about maybe conditions um, I'm sorry before about you know identifying their employment team so the five that we're going to talk about in a little more detail are um, just the introduction to guided group. Um, and that's pretty much what I usually call guided group discovery is guided group, uh, just to give you a heads up on that. Interests and contributions, conditions, accommodations, and disclosure, the art and science of networking, and then pulling it all together and taking action. So let's take a deeper dive into each of those. And we'll start with lesson one, which is the introduction. So lesson one, it's a chance for the group to get to know one another, get comfortable with one another. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a group situation where you know the, the facilitator just kind of says, well, who wants to go first? And everybody just sits there like well nobody really you kind of haven't you know given us any overview and we're really not comfortable and we don't know one another um so it's a chance to get comfortable with one another understand what guided group is all about we talk about the traditional labor market and the customized job search and kind of the pros and cons of each like we talked about in one of our earlier slides and then we ask folks hey does this sound familiar i'll do anything i need a job I'll do anything. Um, and then following up with, how has that worked for you? Um, and if you're with those folks, most likely they're going to say, it didn't work too well, right? That's why I'm back here asking you for some guidance and some assistance. So one of the things that we do is we um, partner people up in uh, the first session and just have them think of three skills or talents that they have. You know, what do you do well? Um, what you know what people have complimented you on in the past um things that you don't really think about until people ask you these questions you know what are some tasks that you do at home or at church or in your community that you feel that you do well and we have people share that with one another um, as, as kind of a way to focus on the positive get people to know one another and then the last thing that we do in session one is we give people an assignment and usually each session there is an assignment so um, for this one it's identifying your own personal network so thinking about who they've helped in the past a friend a family member how did it make that person feel how did it make you feel 
Uh, we also suggest interviewing those in your personal network, so people that they have in their professional network. And some of the questions that we ask are, what do you most admire about me? What do you think are my best skills? I, I can tell you right now, you know, NDI is a very inclusive, very um, supportive organization. And we could be on the phone with somebody and I could say, mm, you know, that part, you know, if somebody else could handle it, that's just not my, my, you know, my best area. And three people could pop up and go, really? Because I, I actually thought you were good at that. I thought I wasn't good at that. So it just kind of makes you think a little bit outside the box. Um, other interview examples are, what do you think I have to offer an employer? What type of an environment do you think would work best for me? And then what do you consider uh, my most positive personality characteristics? So as you can see there, we're really not talking about specific employment information. It's it's that discovery of you know going outside the box and and um, looking at things a different way. So then, lesson two, we talk about people's interests and contributions. So it, what that does is helps those in the group identify what their interests are. What activities do you enjoy? You know, what do you do in your free time? You know, what are your hobbies? And helping per people then think about, well, where do people with similar interests as you work, right? So if somebody has a hobby of they're into bicycles, well, where do people who are into bicycles work? you know, bike shop, repair shop, you know, those types of things. You know, maybe they belong to a bike club. Um, so we also define the difference between skills and tasks, which can be hard sometimes. And, and the way that I define it is my employer hired me because of my skills, but they pay me for completing tasks, right? So if I wasn't doing this today, even though it's what they hired me for, you know, they might say, hmm, what are we paying Nancy for? She's not getting the tasks done <laughs> that we want her to do. Um, and then when we think about those tasks, we think, oh, well, who pays for to have those tasks done? What employers need those tasks? It really helps to be able to help you and help the veteran target their job search and take control over it as they start honing down this a little bit more. Um, it really can help us answer the question of kind of what do you want to do? Um, so one of the other things that we talk about in discovery is job descriptions. So what's a job description, right? It's a compilation of all those skills and tasks and you know, what are your major skills? What are your minor skills? Um, those of you old enough probably remember in 1991, the ADA, um, when that became law, all job descriptions had to be uh, rewritten. Um, and I think they became a little more uh, formal at that time. And what discovery does is kind of goes back to making them a little less informal. So where we have a bunch of things that are bundled together, for a job description, we ask in discovery that they kind of get unbundled, if that makes sense. And the reason that we do that is, again, I don't think, um, and I think this is a question that we ask um, next week, but I don't think many of us are familiar with our full job description. Um, like I said, I don't even know if I've ever seen mine. So it, it helps the employer also to understand what's really important to them. We also in lesson two talk about positive personality traits and there's a checklist and we have people pick, you know, what are your positive personality traits? Are you action oriented, you know, meticulous, ambitious, approachable, resourceful, or resourceful, whatever it may be so that they can start adding that to, to kind of their, their package of what they can offer an employer. And then the last thing that we do in lesson two is we start to identify some vocational themes. And what that means is we look at 
some of the things that people have shown that they have an interest in and that they have a skill in. So I'm, I'm going to say dogs just for the heck of it, because I have a dog and that'll also give you the the warning in case you hear a barking, <laughs> the doorbell rings, that that's Nancy's dog. Um, so if, if somebody had an interest in dogs, we would expand that to a theme of maybe animals, right? Just so that we open the door a little bit more. And when I talk a little bit later about um, vocational themes a little more in depth, I'll explain to you um, how that works. So, but let's, we can go on to the next slide and talk um, a little bit more about themes, I think. So, as I said before, right, not job descriptions um, or, or titles, you know, that kind of often, you know, limit and, and really don't describe the actual work that really needs to be performed. So themes are much bigger than job description. Um, for instance, um, construction is, is much bigger and holds more opportunity than somebody who may be interested in being a carpenter right because construction can open that up to a bigger picture and and what themes do too is they open up possibilities even if in smallest communities and even with the smallest employers and that's one of the things that we'll talk about next week as well is you know the difference in job development with uh, smaller employers and then some of your larger big box employers so the next thing that we do with vocational themes is themes are really the linchpin of discovery. So we, we seek to develop at least three themes for each person. And, and we do that for many reasons, but most specifically, because if you had only one theme, right, and then later you discovered that it was wrong and it didn't work for the person or the person realized it didn't work for them, then you're back to square one. So having three themes kind of allows us to create more diverse um, possibilities. And developing themes is pretty, it's imprecise. It's not a precise um, science, but it provides us with more options for employment because of that. And then we also talk about skills, tasks, attributes, and interests that help shape the thinking of those discovery themes um, and more is covered on that we're not going to go into it in depth but um, in the the lesson that talks about job development that's where you kind of get into that in a little more depth so you've heard rebecca talk about conditions and accommodations and disclosure um, so what we think about here are conditions of employment those things that people need to be in place to be successful okay we all have conditions um i i work from home i have for i think about the past 14 years and i honestly don't know if i could work in an office environment again because one of the things that i've come to cherish is um quiet I, I, you know, I work in solitude all day long. My husband has gone from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. and I have the house to myself. And sometimes when I go to our office in DC, I think, oh my gosh, how does anybody get anything done? Um, it's, you know, it, it's too loud here. It's too busy. There's too many phones going off. There's too many people talking. Um, so we talk about those conditions, and then we also talk about the, the difference between conditions and preferences. So a condition might be, I can't work around chemicals due to a sensitivity. Um, I can't work around fluorescent lights because they trigger seizures, right? So those are some things that are really important conditions that need to be met in order for the person to be, um, to be successful. Um, so we also we also look at what conditions are happening in the person's life right now, child care, parent care, medical appointments, criminal background, transportation, you know, all those things come into play with um, with conditions. And we don't want to mix up conditions with preferences. So a preference might be, hey, I want a corner office on the top floor. Well, don't we all? Um, but that may not happen. Um, if we can work that out for you, great, um, but we're not going to consider that necessarily a condition um, 
for, for someone's employment. You know, conditions are more like time, tasks, the setting, the environment, uh, the pace, those types of things. Um, lesson three also talks about job accommodations. Um, and the one thing I like to point out when we think about job accommodations is, remember, they're not disability specific. Everybody thinks job accommodations are disability specific, but really it's more about the job, right? It's job specific, not person specific. And that's because an adjustment, or sorry, an accommodation is an adjustment to the job, right? It's an adjustment to the work environment. It's, we're not adjusting the person, right? We're, 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 um, we're adjusting the environment. And then we also talk in this lesson about disclosure. And we do that because releasing personal information is private. You know, um, it's, it's a personal decision and it really deserves thought and reflection. Um, I'm 53 years old, I don't mind saying, and I finally disclosed to my employer um, that I had disabilities at the age of 50, just three years ago. Uh, so it's not an easy thing to do. And, and I think it deserves time um, to get people to be comfortable you know, thinking about whether they want to talk about their disability or not. And then once we decide if we're going to disclose, we talk about things like when to disclose. Am I going to disclose at the interview? Am I going to disclose before because I use a wheelchair and I need to make sure the place I'm going to for my interview is accessible? Am I going to disclose after? Uh, the interview. So there's there's that. And then there's um, how to disclose. You know, we talk about the importance of being straightforward um, and discussing disability briefly in a positive light. So there's a whole section in lesson three that I really love that just helps people talk about their disability in the most possible light possible, um, which I like. And, you know, the, the purpose there is just, you know, we don't want people revealing negative information. We want to avoid medical terms and jargon. Um, and we don't want people to dwell on past negative experiences either. So some conditions, um, or I'm sorry, considerations for conditions of employment. Um, we all perform better when ideal conditions are met. So I think that's really important because sometimes in our fields, you know, we'll say something like, well, we don't know when the next job opportunity is going to come along. Um, but, but what we have to remember is sometimes that's okay because we know that when we do find that right job with the right conditions, the right cultural considerations, um, we know that we can help somebody discern which places are the best match. And we know that when we find that best match, we, we have so much more chance of the person being able to, um, to keep that job. So um, conditions, you know, as we talked about, work hours, um, particular use of skills or performance, uh, certain tasks, pay, intensity of supervision, um, could be the culture, could be the dress, humor, um, lots of different things. So these are just a sample of what might be considered ideal conditions for employment. So we talked about this a little bit before, um, informational interviews. Informational interview is a real casual process where a job seeker, you all who are assisting them can ask for what we call an informational interview. It's not saying, are you hiring? It's just saying, hey, I want to get to know your business a little bit more. You know, would you have a half hour to spare where you could give me a quick little tour and show me what your facility does? So it's, it's casual, it's not demanding. It's kind of show, like, show me what you have here. And what that does is reveals kind of some skills and tasks that we find in different workplaces. 
Um, it reveals some ideal conditions for employment that some of the veterans you're working with may be interested in. Um, it helps us warm up in that job development process, helps us to avoid thinking in those job descriptions like we talked about earlier. Um, it also helps us discover new kinds of jobs. Um, so, and that's something that we'll talk about next week is that discovering new jobs um, through, through informational interviews. And really it's a casual way to create a professional relationship um, and it increases social capital. So what can happen during an informational interview is you get to know the business and maybe two months later, they'll call you and say, hey, you know, I still don't have any openings, but you know, I know that one of my, um, one of my business associates does. You know, and I know you took that tour a couple months ago. So, you know, here's the number in case you're interested. Um, so really one of the best outcomes from this approach is that people tend to give you names of other businesses that you might want to talk to. And, you know, it's all about networking, right? I'm sure you've all heard that time and time again. Um, you know, networking is, is um, is really important. All right, I'm gonna speed up a little bit here because as you can tell, I love to talk. Um, so I think I'm going to skip informational interview slide one and two because we pretty much just talked about that. And what I wanna talk about is critical review. So it's really important once you do an informational interview that you then review the process. All right, why did we go to that specific business? What themes did we see there? Did we see any ideal conditions of employment? Um, and then going on to the next slide, how did we contact that business? What did we say? Did that work? How did I introduce myself? Did that work? Uh, how did you represent yourself? Is there anything you want to do different? Um, so I think critical review is really important. Going on to the next slide, what went well? What problems arose? Were there any concerns, right? When we do this again, what are we going to change? Uh, remember, the most important thing is to keep the job seeker number one, okay? It's all about them and where the career makes sense for them. So I think you've heard me say networking a couple times already. Um, lesson four is the art and science of networking. Um, so some of you may know this, 80% of jobs are never even advertised. Um, Rebecca, I don't know about you, um, NDI, my job was not advertised. Um, they, they contacted me um, because they knew me from another project that we had worked on. Um, 60% of people looking for employment find jobs with the help of friend, family, or acquaintances. So that's why we talk a lot about the importance of networking. And I wanna go on to the next slide and talk about what we call the networking pitch. So I am the worst interviewer in the world. Um, my last two jobs I've interviewed with people that I know, people that I know well, people that I respect, people that respect me, and I still did terribly. So luckily we knew one another and we had mutual respect because it's difficult to just start a conversation with someone and talk about yourself. So we talk about introducing yourself, um, name dropping if, if that's a possibility, um, talking about the type of work you're interested in, and then talking about a person's abilities, positive personality traits related to the type of work that we're seeking. And that really helps veterans get comfortable with, you know, the, what tasks they can offer the, the company, they can highlight a success, um, they could make a specific request, like for an informational interview or for a referral. And then, you know, it may sound simple, but we always have to remind, you know, oh, thank the person <laughs> before you leave, make sure you thank that person. So on the next slide, we have kind of a, a funny example of a networking pitch. Hi, my name is John Doe. 
see how that's spelled, and I'm interested in a career in baking. Chandra Hill at the Career Center recommended that I talk to you. I have experience as a baker in the Marines, and I hope to go to culinary school at some point. I'm good working with dough, making pastry, making decorations. Everyone I know asks me to make desserts for the holidays and birthdays. Would you or someone you know be able to use someone like me? So that's just, you know, kind of a, a fun doughy example, but an opportunity for folks to then practice that, right? Practice makes perfect. I work, work, worked with a group in Oregon. Um, it was actually a youth group. It wasn't a veterans group. And after practicing a networking pitch, um, this was a very rural community in Oregon. Um, an individual on his way home from school stopped into a restaurant, used his networking pitch and was hired part-time um, after school. So I couldn't be, couldn't be happier um, that, you know, just, just seeing it in action and seeing it work. So lesson five is, is doing that. It's taking action. Um, and your third bullet there, it says update the blueprint. And that's what I want to show you now. And I'll end my piece of the presentation with is just showing you four quick slides um, about the actual blueprint. So section one, blueprint for employment, identify your team. We talked about this earlier in the presentation. Who are the people on my team? What are their relationship to me? And what's their contact information? And then the next section is contributions, right? Which we talked about. What are a person's interests? What's the person's skills? What tasks have they identified? And what positive personality traits have they identified? And then what emerging vocational themes came from the sessions? What is a person interested in doing? And then where would people with similar themes work? Where are those people out in the community? And then the last thing we do is consider issues around, I'm sorry, second to last thing, consider issues around disability. So those conditions that we talked about that need to be met in order for a person to be successful. And then again, accommodations, disclosure, and kind of framing that sensitive information that a person may need to discuss. And then lastly, we've done all this, now what are we gonna do? We're gonna take action. So we're gonna sit down with the veteran and list, all right, based on our last sessions, what are the tasks now that we want to do? You know, you're going to contact such and such an employer. You're, you know, what are the things you're going to do? And then who is gonna support me in these tasks? Is it, is it gonna be my career counselor? Is it going to be, you know, somebody from my church, somebody come from the community? And then when am I going to do this? So that all of the work turns into an action plan that um, you can then help the person follow on their journey. And with that, I will thank you for your time and turn it back over to Rebecca. Thank you so much, Nancy. So we just, before we close, just wanted to end with a brief discussion of the role of facilitators and partners um, and to provide you with links to some resources that you might find useful. So you may wanna consider planning with partners as you decide to move forward with this. There are some clear benefits to co-facilitation. As the veterans then get access to other perspectives and potentially learn about additional supports that might be available to them. As part of this, you'll wanna consider how to set up the sessions. Um, as I mentioned previously, it could be done as part of a job club if you offer a job club or other group meetings. During this time of social distancing, guided group discovery can be done in virtual small groups. You could use a platform like this one or Zoom or another platform that people might have available to them. But regardless, it's important to think of who you might wanna partner with and how frequently you wanna schedule your sessions. Our experience with people who are homeless 
is that we lost people if we spaced the sessions out too far. We did a pilot in Philadelphia with people who were living in a homeless shelter, and we ultimately moved the meetings to twice a week to keep people engaged because people were transient. And if they missed a session, it was hard to keep their motivation up and, and keep them involved. It's important to develop a strategy for recruiting participants. So in part, you may want to rely on partner referrals, especially partners who work with veterans who are homeless um, or other people who um, the people who utilize your services are involved. You can put out flyers at job fairs. You can put out flyers at American job centers that people might access. Any of the places that people might go might be places that would work for recruitment. And in the facilitator's manual that we'll show you a link to in a moment, there are sample flyers that you can use to recruit people. Um, you also need to think about how to present the material. If you're co-facilitating, you could divide it with your co-facilitator. Um, we provide you with a detailed PowerPoint that you can use to walk people through the five sessions that Nancy just reviewed. But if you want to do something less formally, um, you don't have to use the PowerPoint. You know, depending on the setting that you're working in, you can you can decide that, but the materials are available to you regardless. People also often need support to translate the information they capture into employment possibilities, into those vocational themes, into those potential employer contacts for informational interviews. So it's often good to have co-facilitators assist with that, but peer support can be invaluable within a guided group discovery session, or you can go back to the people who are in someone's network that they previously identified. You'll want to determine if people need support and assistance. So people may come to the sessions with a support person, and that's fine. People at times have brought family members or staff who work with them, employment specialists, to support them through the process. People may need support to do the assignments. They may be fine in the group, but there are often assignments for them to do afterwards. Um, it's important to ensure that the blueprints are completed and it's useful to ask for copies so that you can support someone in their journey toward employment. And it's important to focus on what happens after guided group discovery to provide people with support and to connect people with support after guided group ends. So we want to share with you how to access these um, materials, and these are all live links. So there is a guided group discovery veterans manual that walks you through all of these steps, talks about what you might say as a facilitator, gives you copies of the materials that, that would be used. Um, there is a guided group discovery PowerPoint that you can choose to use to, to present the material. And there's a guided group discovery participant workbook that has the blueprint, but also has all of the other information that people will be collecting along the way for their um, preparing for informational interviews or defining their conditions of employment or who's in their support network. We lastly developed an online participant workbook. And so for people who are comfortable with that, people can create a unique login and put all of their information into an online workbook that automatically self-populates the blueprint for employment and allows people to go back in so that after they've had some experiences, they might want to update their discovery profile in some way. It allows them to download it so that they could share it if they have a VR and E counselor or someone else that they're working with. It would allow them to, um, to share that. And on the next slide, um, we provide you with information about self-guided discovery. And this is another set of materials that Lead Center developed that also has a facilitator's guide to help people discover their own path to employment. Um, there's planning tools that people can use with support from their families or others. There's a workbook for them to work through and a toolbox that has other things that help people 
develop um, their their path to employment. So for people who might not thrive in a guided group situation, you know, this is another another opportunity. These materials are all free and accessible and downloadable. Um, so we encourage you to to access any of them. Um, I know that we have a few minutes left for questions. Um, and again, if there are questions that we don't get to, um, you know, we'll be back with you next week. Um, so we'd be happy to um, to respond to them then. But we wanted to leave a little time at the end for questions. So, Corey, are there any questions that people have? Yes, provided? absolutely. Great. Well, uh, yeah, I want to, um, first we have uh, Mr. Ross from Vast in New Jersey. Um, he asked a, a question that I think is, is really important. Uh, has uh, Guided Group Discovery considered the emotional and psychological conditions that result from job-related racial experiences? It, that is a great question. Um, you know, not specifically, but but, you know, certainly does get to explore what what people are bringing where they're at and what kind of support they might need so that that people who have had those experiences or other traumatic experiences in their in their life you know there would be an opportunity to to discuss that and to you know explore barriers to employment accommodations that people might need um but that isn't anything that we um specifically have um have addressed um, it. It's uh, you know it, I would love to have more dialogue about that because if there are suggestions for things that we could do that might facilitate those conversations and support people, um, that would be really useful. Yeah, and I I think the the potential and um, I. I agree, Rebecca. I have not heard uh, folks really addressing this issue directly, but I think the potential, and as we've been talking about this in the context of motivational interviewing, trauma-informed care, stages of change, all these different pieces, um, is that this, uh, the entire customized employment and, and discovery process uh, is really designed to uh, to meld itself to the folks that we're working with. It is, it is designed to be driven by them. It's designed to be reflective of them. So although we have not had these discussions specifically, and although I think we should, because they're obviously extremely important, and I think um, it, it's just an area where I think the, these, these strategies could play a fantastic role, um, but I, I think just the natural tendency of the process is is to be reflective of the concerns and the needs and the interests and the and the, the of the the folks that 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 you're working with. So um, I think it absolutely has the potential to be a context for those kinds of conversations. Would you? Am I uh, speaking out of turn, Rebecca? Would you agree with that? Yeah. No. Absolutely. But but I, you know I think it really will require some additional discussion and reflection. And if there are or people who would like to engage in that, I think uh, I think it would be really useful because I think you know many of us need to give it more thought and could use some some really good guidance, you know, as to um, you know as to how to approach those those issues that people may have experienced and are carrying with them. Absolutely, and if folks are interested in. Having that conversation, uh, we can obviously reach out to us at contact at nvtech.org. I hope fo most folks on the line know how to reach us. Um, we would be uh, overjoyed to talk about that in the context of, of, of this, these tools specifically, and then just to have that larger conversation because it's something that uh, we should all be thinking about and be aware of in the HVRP community. So please do reach out to us. If, if you'd like to keep talking about that, we would, we would absolutely love it. So please let us know. Um, we have gotten a couple other, uh, couple other. Uh, we've been uh, comments that actually in in relation to your first question about uh, what customization has looked like for, uh, for folks uh, on the line. And uh, Angelo has uh, actually shared a couple different ideas that I wanted to run past you. Um, uh, so one one thought, and I, I think this is really important as a context point. Uh, being as being ex-military, us veterans on the job know how to adjust and customize on the fly to meet our employer's needs. 
at the same time meeting the needs of the veterans we serve. We've always had to do that on the job in the military, and it's a trait I'm very proud of owning. And I, I highlight this not only to, to the, you know, because it's important to highlight on its own, but I think one of the things about customize that's, that's so interesting, we've got all, there, there's a lot of terminology, there are these processes that we've, we've uh, that folks have really drilled, drilled down on and made very clear, but so much of it is, is reflective of our, of the experiences we've already have. It's, it's so reflective of the way we so, we so frequently have to do our jobs. We have to be flexible. We have to customize. We are flexible and we customize in response to the veterans we serve. Um, so I, I, I just think that's such an important point to emphasize because it really does show how, how close this is to what folks are doing already and how much of this is probably already at work in the work that you're doing. No, I, I think that that's great. And I think that that, you know, probably makes this group uniquely qualified to support people in thinking about how to approach employers um, with, with negotiating a customized position um, and, and, you know, knowing that the people who are approaching employers have that same experience of being in positions where they've had to make changes on the fly and have had to, you know, just respond to what's needed. And, and I think, again, as people are capturing what they have to offer to an employer, it's so important to capture that information. I mean, employers value people who can think on their feet, who can, you know, turn on a dime when they need to. It's, um, it, it's such an important skill that people have. And, th and there are so many skills that people have who have been veterans that, you know, just from the discipline of being in the military and the need for excellent organizational skills and those kinds of things that people may not, people, especially people who have been unemployed for a while, aren't feeling very successful. They may forget that they have all these skills and capacities and, and gifts to offer an employer. So I think you all are, are in a wonderful position to be able to help people remember, um, you know, just how much they, they have to offer based on that and that they're used to um, an environment where things have to be customized frequently. It's a great comment. Absolutely. And then just one other comment that that I um, mean uh, we've actually been uh, going back and conversing on the on the back end through through much of this. So I'm not going to capture everything that Angelo offered us, but a, another point he made is that uh, the veterans that are being served through HVRP in many cases, uh, you know, they they arrive with just a, a, a lot of barriers, a lot of challenges, a, a lot of uh, a lot of different needs, and in some cases, as we've discussed in past. Uh, sessions just kind of disengaged from this whole notion of of career development. So every he said every time we're we're meeting a veteran, we're creating a customized plan. We, that's that's part of the that's part of the, the game here. That's part of what we have to do. Um, so just wanted to emphasize that again because I just think it it draws such a line under um, what folks are already doing to respond to all, all the all the barriers, all the conditions, all the strengths, all the uniqueness of the veterans you're serving. You're doing a lot of this stuff already, and this is just a way to really capture it and, and um, formalize it and, and put it into action. So just wanted to highlight that as well. Oh, that's great. That's so well put. So what we typically do, uh, uh, Rebecca and Nancy, just for your information, um, uh, we do we do end at, at quarter after the hour. Uh, so uh, folks uh, who need to, to get back to things, we, we totally understand that if you need to sign off. If you have additional questions, uh, we typically leave the line open for just about five minutes. So if anyone is typing a question, has some additional thoughts they want to share, uh, Whatever it happens to be, um, we will be here for that. Um, but otherwise, we don't want to hold people um, past the uh, the quarter after mark. That is that is what we put on the schedule. So sounds good.
And so for folks who are signing off, I'll just say again, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you certainly to to Nancy and Rebecca for a fantastic presentation. Thank you to, to Rose and Chris and to the team at ODEP who has been so helpful and was so, uh, I, I gotta say, I, I, when I first talked to folks about the possibility of doing presentations like this, uh, just the enthusiasm and the, the, the desire to engage with this, we just appreciate it so much and appreciate your offering up uh, these uh, great resources in the form of, of uh, Rebecca and Nancy and all their fantastic knowledge. And then there's a whole other team of folks that we haven't had the chance to introduce uh, with the uh, Social Policy Research, Research Associates who have been working on the back end with us and um, helping us craft this, uh, this session and put everything in place. So thank you to, uh, to Caleb and Laura and everyone on that team. Uh, we really appreciate all of that. And of course, uh, most of all, I uh, do appreciate our audience members, our HVRP folks, for joining us here today. And um, so, again, we'll leave the line open for a little bit, but thanks to everyone. And we look forward to talking to you again next week on Wednesday. Uh, that'll be our next session, and we'll continue this conversation then.